Welcome to the Jay and Brian Show, the fastest growing talk show podcast in America. Join Jay and Brian for unscripted, thought-provoking, and entertaining conversations about life, business, and the world we live in. Tune in as they spotlight influential communicators, business leaders, and personalities from sports to entertainment. Here now, Jay and Brian. Well, hey, everybody. We are thrilled about today's guest sitting over here. I don't get that very often. You don't get that. (laughs) Mr. Jim Reynolds, Major League Baseball umpire, crew chief, uh, 20, how many years? Four years. 24 years. 24th year. Uh, Jim, just let us know that, can I, I don't know if I can say this on here, that on November 30th, that'll be be his last day. That'll be done. Yeah. Big league umpire. Moving on to uh, being a full-time dad and a full-time husband, trying not to screw up the family routine. Very cool. Yeah. Excited about it. Um, Jim has had a, an amazing career in baseball, especially in, in umpiring uh, two World Series, 2014 and 2018. Yes. Uh, two All-Star Games, correct? Yeah, 04 and 18 also. And it so was 18. five or six divisional or league championship yeah, series. Yeah, I don't even. Just a bunch of those. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of, yeah, a bunch of that stuff. So, yeah. I've been yeah. very, very blessed over the last 24 years. Um, baseball has done, you know, now that it's ending, you know, I look back mm-hmm. on it and realize – it's given me everything in my life that I have, right? I, I met my wife because of it. We have a beautiful son and a great family. And, yep. and, you know, I wouldn't live in Arizona and have the friends that I have here. So we're really, really grateful for the last really 31 years, seven years in the minors um, mm-hmm. and everything that baseball's given us. And, you know, we're excited about uh, the new the new chapter in our lives. Yeah. 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 And and you've been in Arizona the whole time? No, um, I got hired in 1999 by the American League when there were still two designations for okay. umpires. Okay. Um, I spent one off season in Connecticut. And, and one of the things about being a major league umpire is you have to be a minor league umpire first. And, yep. Uh, I lived at home till 29. Till I was 29 mm-hmm. in my parents' basement. I'm going to move um, this for you. Yeah. Uh, and so you don't make any money <laughs> and, uh, you, you don't have a lot of, uh, disposable income. And so, uh, when I got hired, uh, by the American league in 99, I spent one off season in Connecticut and I went, it's a giant waste of my time, right? It's cold. <laughs> it, my off season, it's cold. It's dark. It's it, the weather was miserable. So, um, uh, the following year, I moved to Sarasota and spent four mm-hmm. years there. I had met my wife out here when I was in the Arizona Fall League in 98. Um, we were kind of on again, off again for a while. And then in 2004, we got serious and mm-hmm. uh, I moved out here. So, yeah. Uh, That's of, really serious. So, That's a commitment. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, we know that you, uh, while you were in college, you were thinking of TV journalism. Yeah. Like the yeah, umpiring yeah. was was a yeah. thing, but it wasn't, you weren't necessarily thinking about that as a career. No, not so, at all. <clears throat> What was the switch? Like, so what, was it, is it newscasting? Is that what you Yeah, were? broadcast okay. journal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I yeah, wrote, very cool. I'm a terrible writer. I, I spell at the third grade level, but I enjoyed <laughs> it, right? So uh, the one outlet I had was uh, I wrote for the student newspaper. Me and a buddy of mine did a column. Really enjoyed that. Um, my senior year, because I was a communication major, I had, uh, I did a full year, kind of year internship at the CBS affiliate in Hartford. Mm-hmm. I went to the University of Connecticut and I grew up in the Hartford area. So, um, put together the late night sports cut, okay. the, you know, old school cut and gotcha. tape and yep. feeding yep. Yep. Uh, the the sportscasters the clips that we were going to use and writing stuff up and really enjoyed that. And right before I went to umpire school, um, you know, they had me do it like a dummy, a dummy on air tape and mm-hmm. said, hey, you know, if this we'd be, we'd be interested. And I said, well, I'm going to go to umpire school in January and uh, it's not going to work out. And I said, no way. <laughs> There's 450 kids go. They take about 40 of them. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and uh, I said, I'll be back. And they said, okay, yeah, when, 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 when January's over, come on back and we'll have a spot for you here. And I never went back. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the way, <clears throat> now the way that I got in umpiring was um, at the university of Connecticut, uh, one of the few division one programs that had a JV program. Okay. And the way that the head coach cut cost was to offer a one credit umpire class in which those one full credit, one full wow, credit. A. I mean, let me tell you something. <clears throat> I needed the AJ. Okay. <laughs> and so right. I'm like, okay. Easy a. Um, and I, my, a friend of mine who I, I became friends with that lived in my dorm always knew he wanted to be an umpire. Mm-hmm. Uh, his father knew John Hirschbeck, who was a longtime American League umpire at the time. And and he always wanted, this is what he wanted to do. And he knew about the class at Connecticut. He was, his freshman and sophomore year, he was 
you know, doing the JV uh, regular season and the varsity fall games. And <laughs> he's like, kept trying to get me involved and get me involved. And by the time my junior year came around, I was like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. What the hell? And it was a great way to make some money in the summer too, right? Like, you know, if you had $20 in your pocket when you were in college, I mean, it was pizza and beer and you were living the high life. So, mm -hmm. um, took the class there. Uh, we, like I said, we were doing the varsity fall games and back then it was Mo Vaughn. It was big East, right? So yep. it was Mo Vaughn and K Bijou and, mm -hmm. and those kind of guys way in over. I had had no idea what, what we were doing. <laughs> None. I mean, it was baptism by fire. Yeah. I look back on those pictures and some of the, you know, pictures my father took and he'd come up and, you know, watch <laughs> us and Danny's father would come up and watch us. Mm -hmm. And, then he's like, hey, after our junior year, he's like, I'm going to umpire school. I'm like, I love this. I'm going to. <laughs> like, I'm going. Yeah, cool. And so <clears throat> our parents had to convince us not to go after our junior year. Like, oh, we're going to leave early. Like, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like we were like we were college basketball players. We were going to declare for the draft early. <laughs> yep, yep. They're like, hey, uh, let's let's get the degree, okay? <laughs> you know, in case this umpiring thing doesn't work out. Yeah, it doesn't work out, doesn't or, work out right? Yeah. And so uh, uh, we both, uh, after we graduated, um, went to umpire school mm -hmm. and we both were lucky enough to get selected um, and work our way up through the minors. Mm -hmm. So how many years in the minors? I spent seven years, seven in years minors. and yeah. Uh, yeah. lucky enough, Danny, uh, his name's Danny Isagna. He made it to the big leagues. He was just the crew chief of the world series. So oh, awesome. really, really uh, lucky and blessed to have done this with my best friend. Cause it, you know, you guys are still tight. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. Awesome. Tight, That's so. great. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we, uh, we just spent a whole hour at lunch and we were talking about uh, I mean, baseball, obviously, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, life and and um, having to work hard to get where you want to go. And, yeah. and um, you know, how, how it was not an easy road to get to become a major league umpire. And Yeah. You know, I, <clears throat> I think one of the things that I had to convince myself was that the odds of getting there were going to be so small. And I remember sitting uh, in my room in Connecticut. Uh, like I said, I was living with my parents right after graduate. We graduated in, in May and, mm -hmm. you know, umpire school was in January. So I had time to make some money. And I told my parents, I'm going to, you know, I'll make the money. I'll go to school. I'll pay for it. And if mm -hmm. it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And so I'll go what, get a what job. What percentage of, of minor league umpires actually There's make a, it? Yeah, very few. Less than, okay. the, less than the players because it's oh, wow. almost a lifetime position, right? Wow. Like, okay. The Yankees keep turning over shortstops and second basemen. But in my 24 years, I've outlasted, you know, I've oh. seen, yeah, all of them. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I remember sitting there telling myself, you know, the best has got to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Why not here? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's. Did you ever say, did you have a moment where you're like, you know what, just why not me? I said, I, why can't it be? No, me? it was always yeah. every, every night while mm -hmm. I was studying the rule book and convinced myself that I had done the right thing. It's like, why not me? Mm -hmm. Why not? Why can't it be me? Why can't I be one of the kids yeah. that makes it, right? Because you're just trying to get a job in the minor leagues. You're not, you know, I'm oh, not looking, you. you know, I I kind of take the fullback approach to things, right? Like, you know, if I told you, hey, if we just give the ball to the fullback and he gets three yards every carry, guess what? We're going to win the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Just put your head down and do the work. Why can't it be me, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah. And then you get to umpire school, right? Like I had... I hadn't really, I hadn't done Little League. I hadn't done anything. I'd just done two years up at the University of Connecticut and some summer stuff, right? And then we get to umpire school. And and again, you know, you asked the question, did you ever say to yourself, why? I said that to myself every day, why not me, right? And not as a mantra, like, hey, why not me? That's the way I looked at it, right? And then, then everybody, you get to umpire school and the first night you're all sitting, all 150 students are out there and, they start introducing themselves and tell a little bit about yourself. And he's like, yeah, my name's Dan, whatever. He's got a Southern accent. He's like, I worked at SEC finals. And I'm like, oh, my <laughs> God. And he's like 6'4", right? Yeah. I'm like, that's the first time I go, it might not be me here, kid. <laughs> yeah. It might not yep. be me. But then, you know, you just do the work. You get on the yeah. field and you go, you know, you just got to you got to figure it out. Yeah. And so – uh Danny, and, he, and again, it helped that my best friend was there with me. We're going through the yeah. same thing. We were, and we were both laser focused. Some of the kids that when you're at umpire school, it's five months in Florida, they were treating it like they were on vacation. I go, okay. well, they're out. Oh, yeah. It's easy to, you know, I'm going to get, you know, next. And you, yeah. you just kind of 
you kind of work hard and you battle, battle and, and uh, you, you know, you hope you get somebody's attention. And it's the same way through the minors, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, you don't get seen very often. You have to act like you're being evaluated every day. And the guys mm-hmm. that don't, don't make it. Okay. So it's, it's just about for us staying focused and understanding the grind is part of it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and I know the, the, the call up experience is probably similar to a, a minor league ball yeah. player who's actually yeah. getting called up to the big show. And, um, and, and I, I know that your call up, the circumstances weren't what yeah everybody would, you know, not <laughs> ideal, not ideal. Yeah. So probably the best way to put so it. So he's what, what, uh, Brian's referring to is in 99, there was a massive, uh, str- strike mm-hmm. by the umpires and it was there. We have a no strike clause in our contract. And so somebody thought it would be a good idea to, instead of going on strike, we'll just resign. Mm. And okay. they write in law books that that's not the way to do it. And, and again, uh, a lot of those guys I knew and respected, mm-hmm. And, and like Brian said, the way that I got my job was the league accepted some of those resignations and allowed other guys to rescind to the point where there were 22 openings. I, you know, I was, I was in the American leagues, you know, fold. Mm -hmm. And so they were using me and were going to use me. Um, but it's probably sped up, you know, getting a a a full-time job, you know, by a couple of years, Mm -hmm. uh, very mixed feelings though. Yeah, really? No, I mean, I'm sitting in my bathroom crying to, to my, to my mom going, should I take this job? Mm. You know, something that you've fought for. She's like, Jim, you've worked, are you out of your mind? I mean, you've worked your ass off yourself a long time. So there were a lot of, uh, a lot of things that, you know, emotions on both sides. Uh, those guys had their reasons for doing it. Um, the union actually asked us to take the jobs and they were going to figure it out. And, uh, a lot of good people lost their jobs. So it was a really, really tough time. And, um, you know, it was a, it was a tough couple of years for the profession mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. brotherhood. So, yeah. So but, Jim, we, we wanted to have you on the show today because we wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, how, how is it to make the tough calls that you've made, not only professionally, but personally to get to where you have gotten. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, um, I think it'd be better to ask my wife these kind of questions because <laughs> she could, you know, I, I come from a, a, a very much of an umpire point of view. And sometimes she has to tap me on the shell and go, Hey, this isn't the ball field. Uh, and she's like, you think it's every, black and white. Yeah. Everything's black, black and, white. and white. Everything's a ball or strike or safe and out. And I go, well, in my world, you know, it kind of is. And, and, uh, she goes, well, there's some gray area involved in life. So, um, man, you know, isn't that true? Yeah. Well, there's, and it's very hard for me to, work in the gray areas because my job is so black and well, white. Three, right? 300 fastballs coming at yeah. you a night that you yeah. have to be accurate yeah. on. That's what I, you know, <laughs> that's what I tell my wife all the time. I'm like, I was just in St. Louis last night. The guy's throwing 97 <laughs> miles an hour. I called 300 pitches. I scored 97, five. I get on one flight, come home. Right. And I'm shooting like 4% here. I said, how is that? How does that happen? She doesn't think that's funny though. I'm by, glad by, you guys. By the way, both yeah, of our wife's name is Deanna. I yeah, didn't, I didn't and, that. and I'm sure she gets called everything but that because my wife's like Dina. D- she gets Dina, D- Dina, the, Diana, Diana, Dana. All the, yeah. We've and even it, gotten a uh, Diana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Diana, Diana. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's yeah. funny when she uh, when when she leaves her name at Starbucks or somewhere. It's like Diana, uh, and there aren't too many of them out there. Aren't a lot of Dianas out there. So no. when I meet one or learn yes. one, I, I have I have to talk about it. Absolutely. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so yeah, there's a there's a lot of decision making on the field and, mm-hmm. and like split second, yeah, split decision second making. stuff, right? Split second not easy stuff. stuff, not easy stuff. And you know, people, I you <clears throat> know, I get the question all the time. You know how how are you guys good at seeing 97 miles an hour over the outside corner at yeah. the knee or at the yeah. you know? And does everybody have the same strike zone? And you know, you go from Altuve to Aaron Judge. You know, right. you just look at the World Series, right? And in, in those two guys, and you know, I, what I would say to anybody is that if you put 31 years in the in the honing your craft you'd be really good at it too yeah you yeah. know people think that umpires are just we just show up right <laughs> like we were born where we just you just lift up a rock and pull out an umpire. sure yeah i'm a i'm a dad i'm a husband i'm a i was a kid i was a baseball fan i was a baseball player yeah. um but i spent 31 years trying to get really good at it mm-hmm. and some days i'm better than others and just depends on who you ask but um yeah that's that's how we figured out we and and that with technology when i first started it was about 
kind of self-evaluation. Now, mm-hmm. you know, they've got the computers and they've got the pitch track system. So mm-hmm. this younger generation has been educated and, and evaluated on their strike zone their whole career. So by the time they get even to AAA, the ones that can't do it are weeded out. Mm-hmm. And, and they get a lot more um, feedback electronically now than we ever did. Mm-hmm. It was about how we ran the game and and how consistent we were. Being consistent was as much about as much to our success as as being right. You yeah. know, I remember um, my first spring training. I, I got a, a job in the minor leagues in uh, ninety two. I went to umpire school in January of ninety two. Mm-hmm. Got assigned to the minor leagues that year. But one of the things you do is you go to spring training first. And I went to the Braves spring training. Well, this is when they had Maddox and Glavin and stuff. And the minor I have, league, a, I have a story about Steve Glavin. Yeah, by the way. I, I do too. It's, not, not it's a, this one. And uh, <laughs> and uh, a lot of times uh, the minor league complex is right outside the big league complex. And um, uh, so we'll work the minor league games, mm-hmm. but a lot, sometimes they have the big league pictures come out and do side work or they'll throw a couple innings, not on the big league field, yeah. but on the minor league field. So one day I'm working and here comes, you know, their starting catcher. I, for, I forgot who it was at the time in, 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 in Glavin's pitching or Smolch's pitching and one of the guys is pitching. Right. And I remember like, you know, I've never called. This is like my fourth day ever in the minor leagues, and it's in spring training, so nobody cares, right? And he sets up like on the outside part of the plate, and he throws it. Th- he throws it right there, and, and I call it a strike. And then he sets up like off the plate, just off the plate, and I called that a strike. And then he kept, and he just kept going. <laughs> and then I balled that pitch, and then he came right back to where the last one I called. And that's what it was about back then. Okay. It was about being consistent and not being ridiculous. Sure. And nobody cared. Um, as long as you were consistently, you know, good. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't about whether the ball was, a, you know, now it's about, you know, I, I, I get, I, I have ejections over that pitch was a, a quarter of an inch off the plate at 97. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. Like, how, how could you miss that? Oh, yeah. Well, so the next computer. obvious question is about Robo Ump. But before, yeah, yeah. before I ask you that question, yeah. take us back to when they put the box on the screen. As yeah, a, yeah, as a home plate umpire, what that, how that changed things for you? Yeah, so you know, I was a member, and I'm, you know, and what you think of it? Yeah, the member <laughs> of the, the union, and we were in discussions with the league about, oh, they're going to go. This isn't be, even before they were evaluating umpires. Mm-hmm. They were just as a, as for the fans, they were going to put the pox on the screen. We all knew they, their side knew, Major League Baseball knew that it wasn't accurate, and, and I remember uh, one of their uh, attorneys. Uh, her name is Jennifer Gefsky. She's. I said Jennifer. You know it's not accurate, and we know it's not accurate. So why are you putting it up on the screen? I said, is it just to create some controversy? Is it that split second where it goes through the zone or goes through the box or goes through where the people can see it? it before we – is it that split second? That, huh. And she's like, yep. <laughs> they they get about. to be the umpire for that split yeah. microsecond. Or what, what's yeah. he going to do? That split yeah. second of is the umpire going to get it right based on this box or is mm. he going to get it wrong? And, you know, now it's now it's now it's evolved into, you know, it's an evaluation system. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So. So controversy. That's what yeah. it, that's what it, it created. Comes, yeah. yeah. I, th- I think I think that's one of the things that our department does. Right. Like it insulates the Yankees from the Phillies. OK. You can blame the umpires. Right. But if they go to a robo ump and I know you want to talk about it a little bit. <laughs> but uh, well, but no, I mean, if they go to that, who who, who do they blame it on now? <laughs> The Yankees yeah. are just going to get mad at the league, which is the Phillies. Or the Phillies are going to say, you know, there's nobody to go out. Oh, that umpire was terrible, and that's why we lost. Yeah, it yeah. takes a lot of the emotion out of the game. So baseball is going to have to measure that. And I, you know, they got a lot of smart people up there. They've done, you know, they've baseball is really good. And you know, people think it's slow to change. And you know, it, they're really good at implementing long-term vision in the things. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the things that I've learned, you know, from on our charity side about you know, where you think you want to be in a year. Mm-hmm. And I think one of your former guests talk about this, right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. it's better, you know, taking a five-year plan and projecting out where you want to be in five years. They're really good at that. Okay. And, and, you know, you know, it's like when you buy a new house, right? You have this vision in your head and you want it to be like that tomorrow. But if, if, if you don't put the pressure on yourself to do that and you can create change, Almost organically by that. And it'll be interesting to see where they go with the robo because the technology is there. 
Mm-hmm. It's there. I, I, you know, you go to an Arizona Fall League game and they're implementing there and the game runs seamlessly. Okay. And so now they have to decide whether taking the controversy out of the game is good for the is, is, is good, good for, for the game. The, yeah, it's good for the game. So, because, I, well, there's two ways of looking at yeah. that, right? So one, one of the questions, I, I, I let Jim know that I put this out to a couple of friends of mine that we were going to have them on the show. And what question would you ask an MLB umpire? And one of them was about the technology, of course. And the question was, is, is, is it being embraced internally by baseball as a way to improve accuracy? Or is it being embraced from that standpoint? Is that one yeah, of the so, reasons why baseball is in inter- from your perspective as an umpire and from, you know, the league's perspective in terms of wanting to get it right. Is that. So, yeah, I, I think I can answer this question on a timeline. When it first was introduced and it was first introduced as a way to not evaluate umpires, but help us bring it in because the zones were wide. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, Though it's not accurate, it does a a pretty good job of recognizing the inside and outside part of the plate. So I think early in its inception, um, it was good for the way that I used to describe it. It was good for entertainment. It was good for training. But it wasn't good enough to to put out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, The technology wasn't there early. And I'm talking 14, 15 years ago. And I think that's some of... um, the cultural blowback it had with mm-hmm. with with the umpires it wasn't accurate so don't tell me i got the pitch wrong i understand that i might need to bring it in a little bit but to to think that this this technology is better than me is not not accurate right so now we're we're at a point where i think you know that they call it the spray rate or you know the the, the measure of inaccuracy mm-hmm. is down to a quarter of an inch or something you know whatever the yep. the, the tech the techno guys say and whoever's selling it Mm -hmm. to baseball will say. Um, And so it's, it's certainly been embraced, right? Like um, our guys look at it as a very good way to get some feedback on their Mm -hmm. performance every night. Mm -hmm. Uh, We, we, we look at, we look at the data, we analyze the data. Um, and, And then again, there's this aspect of, it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. It's what it's what the public believes to be mm-hmm. accurate, and it's what the teams believe to be accurate, mm-hmm. and it's what the players believe to be mm-hmm. accurate. So mm-hmm. I don't. This idea that it's not accurate anymore doesn't really hold any water. Meaning, it's not accurate, but nobody cares that it's not accurate anymore. Gotcha. If if you've got, you know, if there's this general belief, whether it's true or false, that it's true, then it's true, right? Yep. <laughs> and so. I think the staff in general is done fighting that perception that mm-hmm. it's not accurate. So mm-hmm. uh, where we are now is you better just call the box yep, <laughs> and, and hope what you're seeing is what, what, you know, and I, and I could go into this about, you know, if you watched, if the A's were playing the Orioles and watched the two broadcast next to each other, you would get different feedback on the box. Mm-hmm. The Orioles might box might have it just off the plate and the A's box might have it just on the plate. So who do you, you know, who do who's, who's right there. Gotcha. So, um, if, yeah, I always if, wondered if that. the players want it and the fans want it, then I'm saying, then roll it out. Yeah. Because again, you know, um, would they lead Would the league lean one way or another on that? I think the league would lean, like more toward the fans or more toward the players? Well, the, they both want it, right? Okay. Like the, the players will tell you and, and, and the players will tell you, well, I'm not a fan. I don't want – and they might mean it except when I ring them up on strike three and they run <laughs> into the dugout and realize I'm wrong. Or I ball a okay. pitch for, for ball four instead of strike three. And then, you know, then they want – at the end of the day, they just want it right. Yeah. And, and, and if the technology allows for that, then then you have to seriously consider it because yeah. because that's where we are in society. Well, you were telling us earlier yeah. that you could you could realize you maybe didn't make the best call. You look over the dugout and well, yeah, I get all my th- feedback. There's three the guys dugout. on a tablet. Yeah. yeah. No, you know. they get it in real time. Yeah. I, the only person that doesn't get the answer in real time is the umpire now. Right. Which which kind of leads us to feel like we're in the middle of a clown show out there. Right. Hmm. Like I'll, I'll go strike three and it's just a suggestion now. 
because the guy, <laughs> the, the dugout over there already knows. They, 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 the, the league has given them iPads to watch, so they don't have to run down the tunnel anymore. And they just oh go, gosh. no, they're just shaking their head at me. And you go, know, okay. Well, I gave him my best shot, 97. I'm doing the best I can out here. I got a 300, guy 300 sitting, a game. Yeah, sitting in front of me trying to do this and, you know, snatch the ball and try to convince me it's not where it was thrown. And, yeah, okay. So, you know, we, 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 uh, our guys take a lot of pride in what they do. And, and, you know, that's, that's the stress part about the job, right? Yeah. Um, you don't want to have an impact on the game. You want to give the fans and the players the best game that you can because they all deserve it, right? Mm-hmm. The fans pay a lot of money to come see a game. You want to give them your best effort every night. The, the players have a lot of pressure on them to perform and do well. And the teams and the GMs all have really heavy vested interest in it. And you, and you know, for us, we all, we understand all of that. Yeah. And so we, we want to perform to our best ability every night. Some nights it goes better than others. So. How, how do you guys manage the stress, especially when you're on the road, you're away from your families? Tequila. You're a hundred. <laughs> what did you say earlier? 140 <laughs> games yeah. that you'll call a yeah. season. Tequila. <laughs> uh, uh, do you guys as a crew, do you hang out when, when you're not calling yeah, we're a game? Each other's, or, we're each other's yeah. family for six months. And, yeah. you know, it's that's the part that you know you have to have mm-hmm. or it can be a very very lonely existence you know some guys do their own things all the time you see them at the ballpark uh, i'm more of a crew guy where hey let's go have some breakfast I, you know one or two guys on the crew if they want to have a cup of coffee in the morning or you know let's go out after the game one of the things that i don't think people really understand is when a game's over at 10 30 because they're usually three and a half hours now um you know the adrenaline's still going and so that's when we have dinner. Hard to settle down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, on a good night, I'm asleep by 2 o'clock, wow. right? And so when you're eating late, especially as you get older, right? Like when you're eating late, having a couple of cocktails every night. <laughs> go to bed uh, late. Yeah, go to bed late. It's not the greatest lifestyle. Talk, yeah. to, talk to any of your doctors. They'll be like, okay, here's what I don't want you to do. <laughs> yeah, stay up late. Drink. Don't, don't do all these stressed. things that don't I do. Don't be stressed. Don't do something that stresses yeah. you. Yeah, don't drink late. Don't eat after 8 o'clock. You know, all these things that we shouldn't be doing. That's our lifestyle. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's it. you know, we try to deal with the stress in the he- okay. the most healthy ways we can. Yep. Uh, but, you know, when you're having dinner at 11 o'clock at night, it's easy to have a beer and yeah. and, and do that kind of stuff. So yeah. uh, we definitely want to talk about your, your charities. We want, we want to talk about uh, um, um's okay, care yeah. and then, and then the extension that you're, you're, you're thinking about yeah. called uh, officials care because yeah. of all of the, the, the crap that umps have to go through and, yeah, yeah. and all of the amateur umps. Amateur you know, umps I tell people, but, I tell people all the time, you know, when I talk to amateur uh, associations and at banquets and stuff, I said, you know, I have it easy, right? Like my yeah. whole day revolves around me being prepared the best I can at seven o'clock. All these yeah. amateur umpires, right? They have full-time jobs. They have families right at their doorsteps. Yeah. You know, my wife's, sometimes 2,000 miles away that she's handling problems I don't even find out about. Mm -hmm. And and these guys have full-time jobs or ladies have full-time jobs and and then they show up at the ballpark and, and, you know, I tell them all the time, I'm like, all I have to, all all I had to do for 24 years was to deal with Derek Jeter. I never had to deal with his dad screaming through the, you know, the the backstop at me, right? Yeah. yeah. I said, you guys, you know, I always tell the amateur guys and ladies, you know, you guys had a much tougher job than me because you have to deal with the player in the in the family so mm. uh, they have it a lot tougher than we are and you know uh, uh the officials all the professional officials are going to try to you know uh, rally around that mm-hmm. and try to uh, per spotlight you know the amateur guys and ladies and in the tough situation that they've been put under lately okay and so tell us about um care so what yeah it's what the do official, we need to, you know, it's, official, know it? it's the official charity of, of the major league umpires it's something we're really proud about um i've been heavily involved at the beginning uh since the beginning the inception of it uh we have four main initiatives one is a college scholarship program uh where we deal with kids awaiting adoption that came from one of our other initiatives which is uh we have we we host kids out at the ballpark of the 30 ballparks uh, throughout the season. Um, kids waiting adoption. Uh, we host them. We provide a ticket. We provide a goodie bag. We provide some money so they can spend. You know, I, I've never found out that figured out the best word to use here because, you know, I grew up in a family where my dad or my uncle would take me to a ball game. It was a great day. Right. Like um, and these kids don't have that. And what we're trying to do is provide a normal day for them at the ballpark. And I know normal might not be the right word and I still haven't figured out the right word, but you know, uh, 
have them down on the field. We have them rub some baseballs. We, mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, just an opportunity to see what it looks like from that from that angle. Uh, we give them a goodie bag. We give them some money so they can buy a Coke and a hot dog because they don't usually have those resources. Mm -hmm. uh, those two, um, we provide Build-A-Bears to kids, uh, usually uh, sick kids in hospitals. Um, throughout, we do about 15 or 18 visits a year. Mm -hmm. uh, we do give out about 100 Build-A-Bears. And then uh, those are our main initiatives. And then we also have a... Uh, uh, like a family care program for retired umpires and amateur umpires in need. Hmm. And so okay. uh, we're really proud of those things. And, and uh, we, we, we have fundraising events and you can go to umpscare.com and, and see what we're all about. It's a great website. We have a great awesome. staff and all 76 major league umpires are involved one way or another. So mm -hmm. something we're really proud of. That's so. really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. So we, we have that aspect and, and we've met a lot of good people and a lot of good kids through that program. You know, one of the one of the things that I talk about um, is the impact of the program that it has on us. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you forget, you know, we get in our routine. And I remember one year we we're in St. Louis and we went to the St. Louis Children's Hospital. Now, there's two kind of cool stories about this. One, um, we ended up visiting one of the ch kids. And I walk in, and it's my sister's college roommate, and their uh, oh my god, their child. And so oh you gosh. see that you see a direct impact. Wow. Didn't know she was there. She didn't know we were there. Um, wow. And you see the impact. And and you know when somebody that's that close to you says, "Hey, man, you don't realize the impact this has on mm -hmm. the kids." Um, it, it hits home a little that's more, huge, right? Yeah. yeah. And and. One of the things that's happened with me was we've been doing this. My son is uh, 12 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing these visits for 15 years. And the first three years, you know, really connected with the kids. Then after you have your own kid, you know, it's like you make an instant. Because a lot of these parents are spending a lot of time because these kids yeah. are really sick, right? It's yeah. cancer and, and mm -hmm. things, you know, that you don't wish upon anybody. Mm -hmm. But you make an instant connection. Once you become a parent, you make an instant connection with the parents. So you spend some time with the kids, but you always check in with the parents, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so we met uh, some really nice parents during this trip. And so this was late August. And... uh I remember uh, getting, not me, but the staff got an email from one of the moms because we bring a photographer and, and she's like, hey, would you, sh can you share some of those pictures with us? And so we sent the pictures over. We get an email back from her in early October and she's like, oh, thank you so much. Now, this is five weeks after the visit. She's like, hey, thank you so much uh, for sending those pictures. Mm. Half these kids aren't with us anymore. Oh, jeez. And you go... And, you know, that's the thing, right? Like Man. you go in these rooms and yeah. they're, they're so full of energy and they're, they're so, they want to talk to you about who the Cardinals or right. pool hosts or somebody, do you know, yep. Albert yep. pool hosts, and <laughs> they're really excited to see you and, and meet yeah. you. And then you realize, so it's very easy to forget how sick these kids are. Yeah. And so those are the kind of stories that kind of hit home and in, in why, you know, and, and every umpire has got one of those stories. Mm -hmm. They've all been impacted by the programs and the initiatives that we do. Mm -hmm. That's why we're really, really yeah, proud that's of what just we're great doing. that you're doing that. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. we enjoy it a lot, but you realize, you know, you realize in a hurry once you become a parent or that, you know, these hospitals are huge and there's no beds, empty beds in them. Yeah. And you go, there isn't a parent out there. You talk about making decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Like tough yeah. decisions. There isn't a parent out there that wouldn't make the decision if you offered them, Hey, uh, you're, you're going to be homeless and you're going to have no money, but you'll never have to come back here again. They would make that deal mm -hmm. in two seconds yeah. for their kids. And, uh, those are the decisions, you know, you talk about making tough yeah. decisions yep. in life. I yep. can't imagine this, those decisions well, those parents have to make. Well, I was telling you at lunch about our middle son, Trevor, and uh, when we discovered he had a, a syndrome and something we needed to look into, he was three years old. No, he was, sorry, he was a year old. And uh, and then we, we uh, he was failure to thrive, so he wasn't eating, he wasn't gaining weight. So we, we they immediately sent us, scared the hell out of Deanna and I, like, oh, you got to take him directly to Phoenix Children's Hospital. Don't don't stop at home. Go. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we get there and of course the whole, you know, we're, we're super worried about our child. We're not, we don't know what's going on. Um, and we get there and almost immediately when I got there, um, w we could tell that there were families and kids that were far, he, he wasn't in a, in a life threatening situation, but the, he wasn't eating and they were really worried about that. But there were, we could instantly see 
um, families with kids who are having trauma that were, were going through cancer treatment. My uh, One of my sisters was a, um, a nurse for a while over PCH, and she would have um, pretty heart-wrenching stories about yeah. those struggles. And um, this perspective, it provided us with instant perspective that our, you know, our, our, our Trevor is going to have some things that we're going to have to navigate as he grows older, but we're going to bring him home from the hospital, yeah. you know, and a lot of these kids and families yeah, don't. So you so, have terminal yeah. So that's awesome that yeah, you guys. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's when, when I talk to soldiers or police officers, you know, I, we, there's this, and, and, you know, what you're talking about here, you, we make decisions, high pressure decisions, but there's nothing I'm doing out there that's life threatening. Mm hmm. There's nothing I'm doing that is going to not make me come home from work, uh, you know. And, However, and, well, you have mile, been 100 uh, mile an hour fastball. Yeah, yeah. I, I have been, <laughs> you have been. Uh, I have been taking to my knees a few times. But um, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, yeah, perspective is huge. Yeah. You know, working working a World Series and and all that stuff is is very easy to get lost in your own little world. And this yeah. is pressure, and this mm -hmm. is oh nobody understands, and I have a lot of response. Yeah, this ain't life and death. It's a game, man. Yeah. So, is it different in a World Series? The players and the coaches are they less likely to be arguing with you? And yeah, you know, here's what I, here's my experience. First of all, stage. I think one of the things that uh, the postseason teaches you it's the game is not any different. It's it's you have to learn to manage the anxiety. It's it's everything prior to the first pitch because here's what happens right like I my first my first World Series play job was in 2014 and I remember going seriously I had the plate in Game Three and I'm in San Francisco and I go can you believe they put me in charge of this here we go and I put the ball in play <laughs> like that's what I said to myself I go hey that's we're awesome. here let's, let's that go is hilarious uh, is, know, there, what, is there tape of that no I don't <laughs> that's before we had 12 battery packs and six mics on. Um, but yeah, that was my thought, you know, and I, one of the other thoughts is, hey, man, they've never stopped one of these because the umpire has been so bad. So you're going to be fine here, kid. Right. Just get through That's it. Tremendous. But it's everything prior to the first pitch. It's yeah. dealing with because here's what you do, right? All, all the, yeah, the self-doubt, yeah, right? Yeah. Like yeah, all the anxiety. It's you're you're convinced that everything is gone that has gone wrong on one of your play jobs through your seven years in the minors and for me the 17th year in the big leagues is all going to happen on that stage <laughs> yeah. tomorrow tonight right yeah and so yeah. the sleep is interrupt it's you know it's a series of naps it's a it, mm -hmm. it's you just get to the game get to the game and then you, then you're in and then once it's going over. you you, you and, and i remember i we walked off the field and it was a i think the giants lost so we played the bottom of the ninth and it, excuse me and it was a one run game and you know I'm like, okay, we get to the bottom of the ninth. I just, don't screw this up. <laughs> in eight pitches, the bottom of the ninth was over. It was two ground outs to the pitcher, a couple foul balls, and a, you know, a line out or something. And I remember just walk, you know, because you you built this thing up in your mind your whole life. And uh, well, it's and, your Super Bowl, yeah, right? right? Like, and you know, it's funny, but I'll, I'll finish the story. And, and I remember walking off the field and. Looking over, the guy next to me was another guy who was his first World Series. I go, just like that, it's over. Hmm. You know, it's just, you you know, you've convinced yourself that this is some kind of unscalable mountain. Oh. Um, and it was a great experience. And uh, it was uh, something that you were glad. But uh, it was funny because my first World Series, uh, Major League MLB Network followed the umpires. And it's called the third team, and it's you know it's oh, out there. Yeah. And they followed all of us, and they interviewed us, and they stayed with us. I mean, it was weird. We get off the plane in Kansas City, my wife and my son, and I mean, there's TV cameras, and we're at baggage That's claim, cool. and yeah. people, and I'm like, hey, they think we're, yeah. <laughs> they think we're someone. They're all asking, who the hell is these these people? Um, but uh, you know what I like in the challenge to I was I'm a a golfer, and I uh, follow golf, and I love golf, and. Uh, I thought to myself, you know, I think the best analogy that I could give anybody was it was like the Sunday at, uh, at the Masters. Mm -hmm. That was the challenge. Does your swing hold up Sunday at the Masters? Yeah, sure, I can lead for three rounds and I can handle, you know, the Greater Hartford Open and I win that right. tournament. But does it held up on Sunday at the Masters when it matters the most? And that was the, <laughs> that's the way I looked at it. You know, that was the challenge for me. So all this work you put in yeah, to and see, now you're here. Yeah. To, does, it, does it, does it, does it hold it, up? Yeah. Does it hold up? That's does great. it stand up? 
um, does it stand up when it really matters? And, yeah. and that was the one thing that I think I took from it all was like, yeah, I can do this. I can do what I'm supposed to do in the most intense situation you could put yeah. me under. So yeah. I think that's what I took from it. You know, that was the challenge. What's harder, MLB umping or NBA official? Well, MLB umpiring because I've never, <laughs> and I would never admit that to those guys. There anyway. was no <laughs> hesitation. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no hesitation. hesitation on that. Not, uh, don't you want to think about it, honey? Not everything's black and white. <laughs> um, um, no, I would. Yeah, if what we do is way harder than what those guys do. It's on the record. <laughs> it's on the record. <laughs> That's it. No, we're friends with uh, you know. We get to know everybody in the profession, whether it be the yeah. NBA, the NHL, uh, the NFL. Um, they all have tough jobs. Uh, we all have parts of our job that just feels like we can't win. Mm. Um, I, the NBA, there are times where I look at the games and how much they're getting yelled at and how much, you know, the back and forth between the players. I don't know if I would be very good at being an NBA official because <laughs> I don't know how much of that I could take before mm -hmm. ejecting half the, the superstars in the league because it seems like all they do yeah. is argue, argue, argue. And those guys are super talented at what they do. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do what they do, and I think they would tell you they couldn't do what I do. So... Can we ask you what your favorite ejection story is? Um, I yeah, I was actually going to ask yeah. about highlights and lowlights, yeah, but yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the ejection stories. Jay. Jay, come on, Jay. 97, 98% accuracy, yeah. right, Jim? I think my favorite one is, um, oh, well, the one people like hearing about was the time that I ejected Barry Bonds. Um, and, you know, Barry is super good at his job. And if everybody that, you know, I probably – dealt with throughout my career he probably knew the strike zone better than almost everybody in some days better than me be like that's out and i'm like you probably have a good point there <laughs> to myself <laughs> uh, i go you might be right but one day um we were i forget uh, whether it was in san i think it was in san francisco and he hadn't played right so he's sitting on the bench and he ends up coming in pinch hit mm. and it was like a three one count and i called strike two and if you know, a little bit off the plate probably, but that's when that was acceptable. And he starts to take off his stuff and pretend he's going to walk. And I called strike two and he kind of gives me a look and comes back and gives <laughs> me a look. Now, remember, he hadn't played all game. It's eight to one. And uh, the next pitch he walks and then they pinch run for him. So I'm like, a pinch run for the pitch hitter. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was for Barry Bonds because, you know, yeah. it's eight to one. He doesn't need to be out there running. Right. <laughs> and so because uh, he's got it like that. Yeah. And and I think Moses Alou was the Moses Alou was the manager at the time. And Barry is his, on his way back to the dugout. He had to go. It was on the third base side. So he's running by me, just staring at me. And again, I'm a younger umpire. So everything I did back you know, they just testing you all the time. So he runs and it's eight to one. It's like the bottom of the mm -hmm. end, right? And so, the of course, the next batter I ring up and the guy jumps like a foot in the air. And uh, Rich Aurelia, nice, nice guy, you, you know, pretty good guy that I got along with. And I'm like, Rich, strike three. So he goes back. Now I hear Bonds. <laughs> and I knew I was going to, there was going to be a problem here um, because Normally, well, probably, when he's done, he just goes into the dugout. But now he's standing with, you know, like this on the top step, watching everything I do. And then I r ring up uh, Rich. And then, uh, you know, I hear Barry and I kind of let it go. And I go, hey, that's enough. And I end up I end up ejecting him. Right. And this is the problem with being an Italian or at least me. Right. I talk with my hands. <laughs> I got a short temper. <laughs> and no. and uh, he comes out and gets in my face and <laughs> Moises comes out and he's just. Bonds is yelling, and I, I swear to God, you, I don't even remember what he's saying because I'm just thinking to myself, you pinch hit, you, you've been following my performance for five pitches, and now you're going to get ejected, right? Like, and I just go, you're not that effing good. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. That's the only thing that came out. <laughs> like, you're not. In my mind, it was you're not good enough to be yelling at me over the only five pitches you've been paying attention to all night. It's eight to one. Nobody else right. has said a word out, but that's all that comes out, right? I'm like, not that effing good. <laughs> and everybody stops for like a split second. Oh They're my like, gosh, that's awesome. And my, so they, we finally, everybody kind of goes away. I've got this picture in my mind. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, Alou, they interview Did Alou. Did I really just say that? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, like it finally just came out. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 that's exactly what, yeah, that, well, 
So Lou says to the they said, hey, what, what happened with Bonds? He said, I didn't like some pitches. And then the umpire told him he wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Jimmy was a very good high school baseball player. He yeah. said. <laughs> but that's the one, you know, I've, I've been uh, lucky enough to manage uh, relationships. And what I mean by that is I, I don't get into a lot of uh, pointing and mm-hmm. dirt kicking. That's not. I try to treat people with respect, and I think, uh, you know, if you treat me with respect, you'll get it back. And I think that's led to me staying out of the nasty stuff. That doesn't mean I don't have objections and we don't have disagreements. Mm -hmm. But I think the way that I handle the players, I've learned to handle the players over my career, uh, and the way they've learned to handle me um, leads to less of that. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer uh, that people treat you the way you let them treat you. Mm, okay. um, and so uh, I learned very young in my minor league career that if you let them yell, they'll, they'll yell. <laughs> and so uh, you kind of nip that stuff in the mm-hmm. bud. You try to come from a point of view that they're not always wrong and mm-hmm. not always crazy. And, and, and if you give them the opportunity to talk and actively listen, it goes a long way. That doesn't mean they're right. You know, one of my favorite replies is, okay, because it's noncommittal. Jimmy, that pitch is inside. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm not telling you you're right or, 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 or you're wrong. I'm just telling you I heard you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, you find, you find now when I use that with my wife, she, she, she's on to me, right? Like when I say okay to Deanna, no, she's like, oh, go, okay, we're going <laughs> we're we're go to you're gonna treat me this way, right? You're going to treat me this way. Okay. We're going to go back to the black and white and yeah, gray yeah, conversation. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, yeah, I think those are the things that have kept me out of the – you know, the, mm-hmm. the highlight real stuff. Mm-hmm. And it allowed me to communicate uh, effectively on the field. So, so did you okay. make up with Barry Bonds? No, no, he wasn't. Itchy. I bet you he wouldn't. He might remember the story, but, you know. <laughs> and I've always said this, too. Um, the great ones don't sweat the umpires. That, that's not, You know, you talk about a, a, a mentality and a point of view that yep. great mm-hmm. people have. They don't look at the bumps in the road as bumps in the road. <laughs> It yeah. just, it just, I'll, you know, strike one, strike two. All they, you know, they act like, yeah, I just need one pitch to hit. So he missed that yeah. one big, yeah. you know, they're, the great ones don't sweat us ever. Never have I had a great player really care about my performance. They, they don't like it. And, and that doesn't mean I don't go out there and work my fanny off, mm-hmm. but they're, they're not focused on that. They're not. And that, I think that's part of the mentality that the great ones have. Mm-hmm. All of them. That's the that, that's one of the consistents I've seen. Yeah, with all of them, it's it's that that mental. They they're not looking for an excuse. They don't. They're not looking to lay blame. They're not looking to leave it at somebody's feet. I'm, I'm gotcha. a big boy. I'm gonna. Yeah. I can handle whatever you throw at me easily. So so I'm gonna ask you one more rejection story yeah. about one where there's a a reel that I <clears throat> happened to see the other night, um, and then I'm gonna segue into officials care. Talk about oh, amateur yeah. umpires yeah. and what they're going through. Um, but um, there, was a, there was a short video of, of you tossing, it was either a player or a coach on the bench. Um, you called uh, two or three check swings in a row mm-hmm. as, a, as a strike. And so my, my question, though, I mean, I want to I know from a, from a professional umpire, what is a swing, what's not a swing? And before you answer, my understanding is that it's really up to your interpretation about whether he actually was trying to swing or not, not necessarily yeah. how far he went. Yeah, that's or not. that's kind of what I look at is what what's their intent here. Okay, you know, uh, certainly if the bat gets too far out, um, then it's going to be a swing. Mm-hmm. But there are times where the guy's swing or his arms take the bat a quarter of the way, and his body takes him the rest. Right, and gotcha. people see, oh, the bat's all the way. His his to me, the intent was to hold to check the swing there. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I look for is, is, you know, what are the hands doing? Gotcha. And so, yeah, okay. uh, I think that was Jackson was some pitching coach I never heard of. And I, <laughs> you, I had you, heard him on were, earlier were, in the day. And you were, and like I said, calm, you're, you're just like, if, get out of here. If, if you let people <laughs> yell at you, they'll yell at you. So, yeah. you know, sometimes uh, ejections happen for the other 49 people that are watching. Not just right. for the effect of the guy screaming at me. So, yeah. 
So tell us about officials' care. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's, one of the things that we've learned, and uh, you know, we were talking. We're all fathers of of youth sports yep. uh, players, um, and one of the things that I've learned watching my son's soccer game, and then you read in the newspapers, is there's a a shocking decline in in amateur officials because they don't want to be involved anymore. Yep. There's too much abuse from f- fans, parents. Mm-hmm. Even the players and coaches, it's gotten out of control. And what used to be a fun activity to keep men, women involved in the sport and and to support youth sports, because that's what they're doing, right? Like, sure, they're out there to make some money, but nobody's making a living being an amateur soccer official. I mean, not at not at the rec levels, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so what's happening here is, and, and again, man, there's part of me believes that that social media is driving this. Everybody wants a clip of, look at this guy's terrible call here in yeah. my son's yeah. 12, 12 year old soccer game. And, and, you know, aren't the parents, you know, they show the parents screaming at the guy and surrounding the official and like there's like that's justified Mm -hmm. and 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 i think also the scrutiny that we're under you know the the uh you know if a pitch is a quarter inch off the plate he obviously missed that pitch that's the that's the phrases they're using you know with us Mm -hmm. that pitch is obviously outside it was 99 miles an hour (laughs) cutting across the zone wasn't obviously anything i promise you i've been back there enough that it's none of it's obvious but that's the expectation now that the, these amateur officials are supposed to be that good, mm-hmm. right? And so it's led to a lot of abuse and a, a rapid decline of officials, which most people say, okay, what's the big deal? If those guys don't want to be out there, if those ladies don't want to be out there, then what's the big yeah, deal? Yeah, and there's a big uptick in people's interest in youth sports. Yeah. So that's a big deal. Yeah, the you big know, deal is, is that no your, kids, it. your kids can't play then. Right. And that's what these it's supposed to be about the kids. Right. We want we want our games to go on. So our kids who have practiced all week can have something mm-hmm. to, to look forward to. Right. Yeah. We've all been on the receiving email. Hey, today's games got canceled for lack of officials. And it's heartbreaking yeah. for the mm-hmm. kids. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. The kids have worked all their whole week They're yeah. whatever. Right. Yeah. And so uh, we're going to. Uh, partner with the other professional leagues and, and draw some attention to this, get, some, get the leagues, the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, get their backing, do some PSAs on this. this and you've already and started. We started this. The calls yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've got the NBA, NHL, and NFL guys involved, and we're going to start fundraising t- for some initiatives. And, and also we're, what we're going to do is we're going to go town to town, city to city, and draw attention to using officiating as a way for kids to make some extra money to uh, support uh, themselves and mm-hmm. stay in the game. You know, after a while, kids can't play at the next level. It, it's a great way to stay involved for me, for baseball, um, <coughs> and, a, and a possible career path. You know, um, if more kids knew how they could become a major league umpire or an NFL official or an NHL lineman or an NBA official, uh, I think – uh, more would be interested in it. So if we can get the, you know, get the word out. Um, I think it would be beneficial for everybody. And so that's what, you know, we're in the process of, of doing. So that's awesome. Yeah. And we've got a lot of interest from, from the other guys in the league. You know, one of the things about Ump's care is, and we've been at it for 16 years is, is that we're way ahead of the other leagues as far as having a, uh, oh, that was my next question. Yeah, yeah. as an official it's, charity, they a lot of guys do their own things locally, and you know it'll be yeah. this guy's mm-hmm. golf tournament or this guy's. But to have a cohesive uh, charity that we're all behind and all uh, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean our guys don't do other things locally. Sure, and that's um, going to be sports officials care. Yeah, that's okay. sports. That's sports officials care, and we're getting the word out now, and we're going to have a. I believe we're going to have an online auction here shortly uh, to raise some money to get these uh, initiatives off the ground. So, and all that, and all that, uh, I know all of that information will be on umpscare.com. So if, if, you know, your mm-hmm. listeners are interested, they can, they can just look it up there. Perfect. So, and know, we'll, uh, we'll definitely include the link in the yeah, thank you. description. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I no, appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. Yeah. So any more friends questions? So, um, Cause like, I so you're, you're a baseball guy. You, I mean, you didn't just yeah. decide to be an umpire without loving baseball yeah. first, right? Yeah. So 
who's your team? Number one. Yeah. Who's your favorite baseball team? I don't have any. You don't have one, no. so that screws. No, if you time. if they <laughs> called you the names they call me, you wouldn't like any. <laughs> the, the question was no, is, the no. question was is when you're calling a game for the team that 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 is your team, are you able to stay totally that's one partial? Of the, yeah, no. <laughs> one of the things that's the minor leagues takes that right out of you, right? Okay. Like, okay. You know, you're in part talking that says Red Cross. You know, I grew up a Red Sox fan. Yeah, and that's where you know I I worked. Uh, I also worked my first game in Fenway, so it was really cool, cool. situation where I would go sit in the stands you know, my whole youth. And mm -hmm. then my first game ever walking out on the big league field, you come out of the tunnel in Fenway, I go, this doesn't look like <laughs> what I'm used to. This is a diff completely different perspective. Um, but no, you you don't. And people, yeah. like, I, I, I'm not kidding you. When people go, who won the, you know, we'll be sitting at the bar or s sitting with some friends and they're like, who won tonight? And I'm like, I have no idea. Because I'm not focused on that. Mm -hmm. I'm just focused on the next pitch, the next play. Um, without that kind of concentration, it'd be very easy to get lost. Certainly yeah. more nights than not, I can tell you who won the game because either we played nine full or <laughs> yeah, <and> you're <laughs> eight exhausted. And a half. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but I have no I have no bandwidth to you know, people's like, Oh, you know, the umpires are cheating for I I couldn't tell you who's pitching or playing. Yeah. Who's up. Yeah. I couldn't. Well, after this, yeah, yeah. after this many years, it's yeah, like yeah. there's it's no just, way you you're could... just so locked into what you're doing and trying to be right mm -hmm. trying to you know just figure out your own little piece of this puzzle that i don't have the bandwidth to handle the rest of it so what's the longest game you've called yeah so the longest game that i had as a plate umpire was 19 innings six and a half hours wow. the day before the all uh, all-star break um and we were in chicago and it was hot and we're all ready to Gosh. go home. <laughs> and even the White Sox, it was six and a half hours, 19 innings. Even the White Sox, some of the guys, like, because the White Sox gave up three runs in the bottom of the ninth. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Papelbon was the pitcher. And they even sent some of their guys, like, oh, get on your flights. Because they were all, everybody's going home for, for three days off. So the White Sox, or, or I'm, I'm not sure if it was the White Sox or the team they were playing, sent a bunch, I think it was the Red Sox, sent some, sent a bunch of their guys home before the game was over or told them to get Jeez. heads to the airport. Oh and, you know, we go 11 wow. innings in, uh, or 19 innings. And I remember uh, J Jason Veritek was catching for the Red Sox. And, I mean, I was so tired, so just mentally spent. Because imagine, you know, one of the things that, my supervisor used to say, goes, hey, try to drive for six straight hours. See how fried yeah. you're. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. just yeah. Well, because of that intense focus. Yeah, yeah right. There's no and, way. And, and, well, and no a lot of times you're looking at radio stations and yeah, talking to your wife. And you're on your feet the whole time. Yeah. Six yeah. and a half hours. Yeah. You know, the catchers get to sit down. They don't let you go sit down. Yeah. I swear to God, there was a couple <clears> pitches that I think you're know, like were curveballs and after, if the ball started breaking, I, I, my, my mind couldn't follow anymore. There were a couple of times, like it, right down the middle ball, and Jason Veritek would just take it and throw it back. Like nobody cared. Yeah. Nobody yeah, cared. Yeah. Uh, but and then I, the longest game I was involved with was Game Three of the 2018 World Series, where it went okay. seven and a half hours, eighteen wow. innings. Um, thank God that game was in. Uh, L.A. instead okay. of Boston so, because yeah. weather. Yeah. It, what, no, I'm, Game two, I was in right field in Fenway, freezing. Mm -hmm. Almost one of the coldest nights I've ever been out there. And then, you know, when we're in L.A., we're starting those games three hours earlier mm -hmm. because we're we were on the East Coast well, it's prime not, time. Not Boston in October, yeah. first yeah. yeah. And so it, it had, you know, we walked off the field at 1230 mm -hmm. West Coast time after starting at 5. So if we had been in Boston, seven and a half hours would have been 330 in the morning. I'm like, oh. who's watching this? It was 3.30 <laughs> in the morning anyway for well, them. it's a World Series game. Though. But I'm like, people were like, oh, yeah, I went to bed and woke up to <laughs> go to the bathroom and get a drink of water. And you guys, still are, on. Still, you guys are still on. I'm <laughs> like, what's going on? But, yeah, that was the longest. That okay. was the longest game okay. I, I think I was involved with. So, yeah. Okay. So, I have another question for you. Yeah. It's a big topic right now. Yeah. Ending the shift. Good for the sport or not? Yeah. Um, we, we certainly have – this sport has certainly evolved – to mm. numbers, right? Yeah, which and, is what the shift is all about. Yeah, it's just playing the numbers. They're playing the numbers. <laughs> so I don't think they ever envisioned it to get to this point. Mm. Um, and we're now, but again, right, there's two ways of looking at this, right? Like you continue to do what you're doing, 
and the shift ruins the game, or you change your approach. Or you just adapt to it. Yeah. You change, you know, yeah. when you talk to the older but guys. But that's an interesting conversation for pitchers, right, who now maybe have to think about where the shift is on and, and affects how they're going to throw to this. Well, no, they, hitter, I mean, right? it's all part of the package now, right? Yeah. The shift's here, so this is where you're going to throw the ball. Right. This is how we're going to pitch this guy. the chance it goes right into the shift. Yeah, because if you're not pitching the guy that way, then yeah. the shift is irrelevant. Right. What The interesting part is when you talk to the older guys who are first base coaches and third base coaches, right? Mm -hmm. And they go like, you know, back in our day, if we couldn't put the ball where we wanted to as an offensive player, then we, we never got a chance, right? You know, those guys could, you know, Wade Boggs would just – Boom, boom, and take it. Uh, Curtis Granison is an interesting guy that I always kind of refer to. Um, prior to the shifts being the big thing, Curtis, really fast guy. Uh, lead off hitter, mm -hmm. stole a, a ton of bases really fast. Really fast right up until the end of his career when he was batting fourth for the Mets. Mm -hmm. But prior to the shift being so prevalent, they would play him in, and he'd still bunt the ball <laughs> like and beat yeah. it out, right? At the end of his career where he's batting fourth and the game had changed, they were shifting him and he wouldn't take the bunt because that's not how the game's played anymore. Yeah. It's about, you know, well, he's, hitting the ball as hard as you can every time you can. Yeah. And nobody cares about anything else other than that now. So, oh, so I think it's all part of the package that it's become. And, and you know, that's that's where baseball is. They have to decide whether they what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's inter I mean, it seems like it's it's about pitchers throwing rocks, basically. You yeah. know, there, there's not, you know, the uh, <clears throat> um, Greg Maddox, you know, Oral Horsizer. Nobody's pitching the spots anymore. They're not. not They're too pitching much. to that box as hard as yeah. they can. Yeah. Throw it as hard as you can and pitch the box. And it seems like every time the camera goes to a player, he's pulling his, you know, where do I need to be on this? His card. And yeah. it's, it's it, yeah. the analytics have gotten out of control. Uh, well, I don't know if out of control is an appropriate way. Well, I mean, they've, they've taken over a big part of the game, and that's mm -hmm. part of – you know the the internal struggle everybody's having in baseball. Do you is it too is it too data driven? Hmm. And it's the same with the umpires, right? Like yeah. every, every every call I made for the last fifteen years has been recorded, has been graded by somebody other than an umpire, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, right. And you know it'd be like somebody coming in here that knows nothing about your business and telling you you're doing it. You know, you got that one wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you. Well, we kind of get that sometimes. No, I'm sure you we, do. we're going to yeah, need no, we're no. going to need this. No, you don't. <laughs> That's uh, exactly. Yes, we do. No, you, don't, you so, don't need that. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> I'm not going to provide it. I'm not going to provide. It. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, then, exactly then, we're, then we're not going to provide an underwriting yeah, approval. Yeah. They, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the same thing, right? And so, where what people don't, you know, you always get, oh, why isn't he? Why don't they fire him or send him down? We are the level of accountability for the major league umpires and the staff is is unprecedented. I mean, every mm. single call that I've made over the last 15 years, whether it be ball strike, safe out, any of it, has all been recorded and graded. Mm -hmm. And so um, we are super accountable. I just don't think the fans care about that. And they just, they, 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 they're rooting for their team. And, and it was interesting. It was put to me in an interesting way. Uh, they need that runner to be safe. They don't want him to be safe. Right. Right. The players, the <clears throat> managers, the GMs need him to be safe. They need him because the analytics told them that that guy should steal. And yeah. this is the numbers indicate that this was a good time to steal. And we can't have that guy in in black messing up <laughs> our our game plan here. And so, so so what advice do you have for for young maybe they're not they haven't decided to be an umpire yet but they think they want to be an umpire you were telling us at lunch that it's a different world now for you yeah know, what, i mean it's a different what, world what constitutes a, a good umpire it's like they're looking at the the numbers and they're looking at the you yeah. know accuracy yeah number. and that's what that's what matters like uh, we were talking at lunch you know being a crew chief it's my responsibility to kind of run situations and run, you know, manage personalities. That's what yeah. I do at this, at this stage of my career, I'm managing personalities. I'm managing uh, egos. I'm managing my guys. I'm managing the managers. You know, uh, that's what I do. Um, and that comes with time and experience. Yeah. Though, right? and, and again, man, you guys have probably talked about this in, with other professionals. And uh, this generation wants to kiss, uh, skip steps. Yeah. Right. Uh, hey, yeah, I scored 98. Quick, that quickly. makes me a better umpire than you. Well, there's a lot more to going into what I do <laughs> than calling that box or calling right. pitches and strikes. I know the fans think there isn't. Mm -hmm. You know, they want the best guys that can call that box 
They want us to be right as much as possible. But there's a lot to going into being a successful umpire than other than just balls balls and strikes. Yeah. And and again, you also has that you have the have the ability to command the game. Yeah. You know, and that's really not just yourself when you but need the to. other umps. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, when you need to. Yeah, yeah. You you hopefully nobody knew we were there. That's that's but but you also, that's to Brian's point. It's like that only comes with experience. Yeah. And you've got this experience. And now you know, heading into retirement, do you feel like you're going to be missed from, you know, well, I think an that's asset where I, perspective? Well, from an asset perspective, mm-hmm. baseball's put 24 years into me. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they think that they're losing somebody that could be a crew chief. That's somebody that they didn't have to worry about on a day to day basis as far as. Are we making the right decisions? And I'm not just talking about, you know, am I managing so are they people say, correctly? Jim, we, would you consider coming back for like an encore presentation? No, they, let me <laughs> like tell you something. They're getting what, of, what about this, Jim? Yeah, no, they're getting. They some, offer you enough yeah, money. Jim. No, they're, they're, they've got. There's some, a number that's no, written on the back of this no, paper, Jim. Let me tell you something. I've been around baseball well, long enough to know that that's, that's not, not happening. <laughs> <laughs> they 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 got some really smart people. That's they they're they're good with their numbers. Um, <laughs> they got some really talented young people who who are really good at calling that box, mm-hmm. um, and that will blossom into leadership roles in the future. And you mm-hmm. know that's part of part of you know getting older, right? And, and getting experience is sooner or later that your your time has run its course. And and I feel like. I've had a great career and my time's run my course. Mm-hmm. They'll be in good hands. They got a good group of supervisors who know how to identify those guys. And, and, but I think, you know, going back to the original statement is just because you're at one good, good at one part of your job doesn't mean that you're, you've got experience and there's nothing that, mm-hmm. you know, you guys know this and your job and other people you've talked to experience is way goes way beyond you know, just in being able to run the calculations yeah. <laughs> and knowing the numbers, right? It's it's managing people, it's managing situations, it's it's yeah. how you deal with people, and so uh, and that's all learned. And yeah. the guys who are going to be good at it, or the guys who are going to take it seriously and pay attention to the older guys, and, mm-hmm. and and you know, I had some great mentors and guys who allowed me very young in my career to ask a lot of questions of them. Of why, you know, I'm a big why guy. Why you why'd you do that? Why'd you say this? Because I'm not questioning them. I just tell me why just, you used that uh, phrase. Tell me why you did that. Yeah. Tell me why that was beneficial. Tell me why you waited a half inning to pull, put the tarp on or, you know. It's a learning uh, exercise yeah, every time. Yeah, all in, in you know, yeah. uh, the guys that were great mentors to me took the time to explain why they were doing things. Yeah. Um, I don't see that much as much with the younger umpires. You know, hey, I scored 98 mm-hmm. yesterday. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, like I said, there's more to, to this job than yeah. that. Uh, well, you you didn't have a score like that when you got started, No, no, right? no, no, yeah. it wasn't. It was about being consistent. It was about being yeah. believable. It was about, you know, running your game. Yeah. Now it's... Now what's it's, your score? Yeah, no, it's what's your score. <laughs> and, and it's online, too. So I think some of our guys um, live it. Yeah. You know. They, so what's next for you? No, no, uh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, Nothing. No. <laughs> you know, I, I how, to, how is how I is retirement going so far? It, 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 well, I was explaining to you at a young lunch, age. Right? You're like, young yeah, for retirement. Fifty three. Yeah. Um, uh, How's your wife o- like my, in you home? My off season's always been a four month kind of retirement, right? It's okay. like you know, I'm That's I'm true. on the road for eight months, and then I reintroduce myself to my family for the next four months. Ask me about retirement in March or April. When I'm normally working. Okay. When the new season starts. Because my off season is like retirement, right? It's, I have yeah. no response, no true responsibilities. I help a lot with the charity and I get to go to soccer games and I get to, you know, pick James up and help my wife. You'll actually out. know what the weather's like here in March. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, then, I can imagine I'm, that. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of June, July, and August. Yeah. I remember the first time <laughs> I. time to be gone. Yeah. I remember the first time I walked off a plane at like 1230 here when, when I first moved here in 04 and, you know, I was gone for maybe the first month of the season. So it was May and, you know, you get in, you get into town late and it's, they opened the door and it was just this oh. overwhelming heat and i looked at my watch and i'm like <laughs> it's 11 30 and it's 98 degrees out and i'm like oh this is gonna yeah. be different uh deanna doesn't mind the heat um and so uh, i better get used to it yeah, yeah. 
So, I, you know, I'm not home much in the summer. So it never yeah. really, you know, it was a week here and a week there. You know, we get four one-week breaks during the season. Other than that, you're not guaranteed to be home at all. Uh, occasionally, you know, I might have one or two series here in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. So I'd be home for the, that that time. And, mm -hmm. of course, spring training. But the reason they have spring training here is because the weather. Well, so perfect. Yeah, it's perfect, yeah. right? So, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to get a full blast of the – Arizona summers, <laughs> first time in you know sixteen years or seventeen. Any years. any chance they would call you to fill a hole in the Cactus League? If no, no. I can't. You know, it's oh. all union work. Oh, okay, so, okay. Um, no, they can. You may, uh, you may need to buy a second home. Yeah, you know, maybe <laughs> cabin in the woods. Do you guys know of anybody that can help we me do, out? Yeah, we, we happen to. You know, do. It, it's no, funny that mountains, you are, that mountains are lovely here. In no, Arizona. you know we. <laughs> We've spent, uh, I was lucky. Have enough. you been? <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky enough to grow up. Um, my grandfather owned 300 acres in Vermont. And so we never used it. We weren't skiers. I played basketball, but we used it in the summer all the time. And so a couple of years ago, uh, we rented a cabin up in Flagstaff and we're sitting there, me and my wife are sitting on the, and the wind's blowing through the trees. And oh. she's like, I've never seen you so calm in my life. And I'm like, cause this is my happy place. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, this is what calm looks yeah, like. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And so, yes, if there'll be a place in Williams or Flagstaff or somewhere like that here yeah. shortly, hopefully. So that's, uh, that's the game plan. Cool. Yeah. Well, any more buddy questions? Stump the ump? I don't know. I, I think Stump the ump. Yeah, I like that's, that. that's what they call it. I, when I work. Do you ever watch a game and criticize other umpires' calls? No, you know, I have a, that's a really good question because I, I have a hard time watching games uh, because of the anxiety that I feel. It, I think it's mm. a little bit like watching our kids play sports. You can't control well, you any feel, of it. And you feel for the guys who are doing the job at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I know the pressure they're under yeah. and I know the scrutiny they're under. And so very rarely will I criticize, you know, their performance. Right. I might go, hey, I probably wouldn't handle that situation that way. But again, that's, you know, I think a lot of learning in life is sometimes learning not how not to do things. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so, but no, I have a really hard time. Like um, very rarely uh, do we put on the postseason at all just because mm -hmm. I, I can't. <clears throat> The anxiety because I feel like I'm there, okay. But I'm not working. That's fine. I mean, that for that's me, that's, that's, yeah, when, that's really for me. That's when baseball comes alive. In the yeah, no, I, I get that. No, yeah. I get that. But it's very, very hard for me because I understand the pressure, the yeah. scrutiny, all of it, yeah. right? And they're just one pitch or one play away from it just being about them. Hmm. And all we're trying hmm. to do during the playoffs is just not make it about our performance. Yeah. So. Yeah. Do you practice your punch out calls? Never. Do. Does each Never. umpire have like a signature move that no. they kind of own that nobody no, else see, will try to emulate? Thing, right? Like if you go back, you guys, you were talking about your early podcast, right? Yeah. And how it looks <laughs> nothing the same. It was, it, was, it, it, it was bad. It was, right? it was like bad. when you look at me, because I'm on TV, right? Like yeah. uh, you can see like how I used to work and how I work now completely different because none of it was scripted. Okay. Uh, when you're in the minor leagues, you feel like you have to work a certain way. And back then it was about projection. Well, you were saying earlier that it's about showing that you're in at every yeah, single pitch. So, yeah. <clears throat> but now that I have 24 years and my mechanics are much more relaxed, my demeanor is much more relaxed. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, I'm not defending every hill. You know, when yeah. you're a young umpire, you think you got to defend every single hill. It's like being yeah. uh, being married young, right? Like, you're like <laughs> I don't have to fight her on everything. Yeah. Once you learn that, you just go, okay, dear. Um, yeah. <laughs> But when you're a young umpire, and, and it, this was before the box and stuff, where they just, I mean, if it wasn't down the middle of the plate the first five years of my career, they were yelling. Okay. All the time. So yeah. learning not to defend every hill is, 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 very, is, is a key aspect of maturing on the field, for sure. I like that. So That's going to be a short... I think. Oh, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> Cut that out. <laughs> same thing in life, Order right? Up. Order up, <laughs> Brian. Same thing. <laughs> you, I kind of look at my wife and sometimes go, why are we defending every hill today? Why? Just just let them have a Sprite. <laughs> right, right. Let them. Yeah. I, I understand, you know, but we, we got to. That's know. actually a perfect euphemism for parenting. Yeah, like right. You, just, you don't just, have to defend every hill. You trying to defend no. every hill. Because you'll, you, you, it'll be you exhausting. Win. Yeah. And, and then they tune you out. Yeah. That's what I've learned, too, right? Like, you you just got to, you got to, you got to listen to them sometimes. And they, you know, one of the things, Hey, that's a good point. Yeah. Let me go talk to the crew on, uh -huh. the, on the situations where I know we I already know the answer. 
Yeah, but I'll, oh, yeah, I'll yeah, give yeah, him yeah, the impression. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. yeah we're going to try to work this yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can think about that. Yeah, and then it's not going to come back in your favor. But <laughs> but sometimes they just want to be heard. <clears throat> That's yeah, all. you're allowing them to be heard. Yeah, to, to and make, you're not make, crazy. Make a point. Yeah, yeah. Well, once I came from that point of view as a crew chief, oh, and as an umpire, it completely changed. Okay. Yeah. Paul, awesome. you know, Paul, somebody like Paul Goldschmidt, who's now in St. Louis, mm. he's got something to say. I'll listen. Yeah, sure, Paul. Mm. Because if you're not screaming all the time, you've got a better chance of getting listened to. Yeah. I can I can give you, I promise you that. Gee, I say that to my boys That's all right. the time. Like, like, let's talk about, you know, do you think yelling at me right now is actually going to move the needle yeah. in your direction? What do you think? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. The answer is no. No. <laughs> in fact, when when both sides are digging in, that's not a good. That's not a good. You are screaming. I am not. Yeah, that's not a good place yeah. to be ever. And I think that's what you do as a young official. Yeah, you dig in right away. Yep. You don't want to be wrong. You you. Yeah, I missed it. I've I've called pitches where I go strike one, and I turn to the bat. I go don't swing at that. I missed it. <laughs> that's. It was the truth. I, I did think of one more question, and my wife will appreciate this question because as a teacher, so she's uh, she started in the classroom. She's now a counselor. But I remember going to sit in on her classroom when she first started teaching in junior high, um, seventh graders. And I, I noticed it, she was like cracking that. This is like the second day of school, and she's cracking that whip, and she's like putting them in their place. And like, and I'm like, I remember later going, honey, you were you were kind of mean. Like, like is that what you're – she goes – Oh, she goes, listen, if you don't, if you don't crack the whip and set them straight and, and set the expectation in the first week of, of, the, of the school you're year, you're, you're done. You're done. And so my question is, when you're starting out as an ump, or well, like when you maybe first get to the majors, if you make it to the, to the mm -hmm. major leagues, do you, is there, where, where you don't take anybody's crap, where you're just, yeah, you're, you're really yeah, kind of like, there's a certain to set an of expectation of you're not going to. Yeah. Uh, early in my career, they yelled about everything. And I think I said to you guys at lunch, now if they're yelling at me, it's because they know I'm not doing a good job. They, their, their default position with me now is let me work. But that okay. comes from the fact that you've earned that for 20 years or 15 years or early in my career, I did exactly what your wife did. Mm hmm we're going to set the rules. People treat you the way you let them treat you. And that's what your wife was saying. Yep. Yep. If I let them treat me this way now, it's better for me to shut it down now. Mm -hmm. Shut it down early. And that's what we did. You know, it's funny. When I was in the minor leagues, you get paid only for the time that you're working in that league. So my first my first year, I worked in a league that was two and a half months. And then I, I had the rest of the year off um, or after the season off. So I used to substitute teach. <laughs> It was the oh, same wow. way. You're cool. being in a, being in a, a substitute teacher is the same way of being a minor league umpire. You just got to you got to set the tone early yeah. and let them know that you're not you're gonna gonna, and, and you're going to be consistent with it. Yeah. And so if you handle that as a handle yourself that way, and again, that doesn't mean you're not approachable. That doesn't mean that mm -hmm. you're not professional. But the second somebody is treating you unprofessionally and you address it, everybody sees it. And so they, that's exactly what your wife was doing. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And so, we, yeah, you learn that lesson early. And the guys who aren't successful don't because they get eaten alive. And that's Because they never yep. stop. They never stop. Well, and they probably get found out before they get out of the minors, yeah. right? I've worked with a lot of good guys, good guys in the minor leagues that couldn't umpire. They just couldn't do it. And a lot of it had to do with they just weren't willing to just shut not it down. wired, not yeah, wired for it. Yeah, just not that wired that <laughs> way, yeah. And they would just get abused to the point where I would have to step in. <laughs> when, <laughs> hey, really quick. Yeah, uh, we're not going to be screaming at everybody <laughs> tonight. So then I'd insert myself in their situations. And, yeah. you know, that, you know, you got to handle things the way you think you need to handle them. So, yeah. Well, I don't know how long we've been talking, but I don't we either. probably need to let Jim get back to his family and, and uh, his retirement. Because every day is Saturday, baby. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I got about a thousand straight nothing. Saturdays coming at me. <laughs> but uh, this has been a so lot of fun. Yeah, being no, on the show. a lot of fun, been, too, guys. I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to talk about what we're doing on the charitable side, yep, too. Absolutely. That was uh, that was very gracious of you, and, and hopefully some of your listeners will click on and, and yep, see we'll what we're We'll have all that doing. information yeah. down in the description, we will. for sure. Appreciate it very much. Well, thanks, Jim. We really appreciate your time, and great Enjoyed it you. a lot. Thank thanks you. again, Jim. Yeah, you got it. Thank you.